Edvotech Informational Video Calculating Transformation Efficiency The basic unit of all living organisms, from bacteria to humans, is the cell. Most cells contain DNA, which is the genetic blueprint used to build an organism. In nature, bacteria pass small pieces of DNA back and forth in two unique ways, which we call transformation and conjugation. In transformation, a bacterium takes up free or exogenous DNA from the surrounding environment. Some bacteria, like Haemophilus influenzae, do this naturally to acquire new DNA. Other bacteria, like E. coli, can be forced to take up DNA and become transformed, even though they are not naturally competent. In contrast, conjugation relies upon direct contact between two bacterial cells. A piece of DNA is copied in one cell, the donor, and then is transferred into the other cell, the recipient, through a bridge-like connection. In both cases, the bacteria have acquired new genetic information that is both stable and heritable. Although not essential for the cell survival, this DNA can provide an advantage. For example, the gene that codes for beta-lactamase, the enzyme that provides resistance to the antibiotic ampicillin, can be passed between bacteria. This gene impacts the way doctors treat people with specific diseases. In nature, these extra non-essential genes can be found on small circular pieces of double-stranded DNA. These pieces of DNA, called plasmids, make it easier for bacteria to exchange beneficial genes. They are capable of self-replicating or copying themselves within the microbe, and they are separate from the cell's chromosomal DNA. In the laboratory, we can engineer plasmids to contain genes from different sources. Once transformed into bacteria, the plasmids turn the bacteria into living factories to create medications, vitamins, and other useful products like insulin, the medication used to treat diabetes. In the classroom, we can program E. coli with a jellyfish gene, making them glow bright green. Since E. coli are not naturally competent, we need to force them to take up plasmid DNA in the lab. This can be done with electricity in a process called electroporation or through physical means in a heat shock. In a heat shock transformation, the cells are treated with calcium chloride to make them competent. DNA is added to the cells before they are heat shocked or moved quickly between two very different temperatures. It is believed that the combination of calcium chloride and the rapid change in temperature changes the permeability of the cell wall and membrane, allowing DNA molecules to enter the cell. Rich media is added to the cells, and then they are allowed to grow for 10 to 30 minutes. At this time, the cells repair their walls and membranes, copy the plasmid, and begin to express the antibiotic resistance. The cells are plated on selective media and allowed to grow overnight. Each colony on the plate represents one transformed cell. So let's talk about transformation efficiency. In practice, transformation is highly inefficient. Only one in every 10,000 cells successfully incorporates the plasmid DNA. However, since many cells are used in a transformation experiment, about a billion cells, only a few cells must be transformed to achieve a positive outcome. We can use the data from our experiment to determine how well our transformation worked. Because each colony growing on our nutrient agar originates from a single transformed cell, we can calculate the number of cells transformed per microgram of plasmid DNA. This is the transformation efficiency. To calculate the transformation efficiency, we need a few pieces of data. First, we need the amount of plasmid that is used in the transformation in micrograms. This lets us know how much DNA we are using. A common amount of plasmid to use for transformation is 10 nanograms, or 0.01 micrograms. Next, we need the final volume at recovery. This includes the volume of the competent cells and the recovery broth. So if we had 100 microliters of competent cells, to which we added 250 microliters of recovery broth, our final volume at recovery would be 350 microliters, or 0.35 milliliters. The third piece of data that we need is the volume of cells plated on the nutrient agar. This is important since we don't always plate the entire volume of the recovered cells. Too much liquid on the plate can make the colony smeary and difficult to count. 
Usually, researchers will plate between 100 and 250 microliters of the cell suspension. The final piece of data required to calculate the transformation efficiency is the number of colonies on the plate. Each colony represents one transformed cell. So that you don't miss a colony or count a colony more than once, we recommend using a marker to tick off each colony on the back of the Petri dish. We can then use this data to calculate the transformation efficiency. So let's do the math. If 10 nanograms or 0.01 microgram of plasmid were used to transform one milliliter of cells and plating 0.1 milliliter of this mixture gives rise to 100 colonies, then there must have been 1,000 bacteria in the one milliliter mixture. Dividing 1,000 transformants by 0.01 microgram of DNA means that the transformation efficiency would be one times 10 to the fifth cells transformed per microgram of plasmid DNA. Transformation efficiency generally ranges from 1 times 10 to the 4th to 1 times 10 to the 8th cells transformed per microgram of plasmid. A fun way to explore this concept in class would be to change the heat shock conditions and to analyze the results. Can we make our transformation more efficient by adding more DNA or changing the duration or temperature of the heat shock? Try it and find out! <laughs>